I'm Emily Kwong, host of the new podcast Inheriting from LA's Studios. Join me for an immersive evening about Asian American and Pacific Islander families and their histories. June 27th at the Crawford in Pasadena. Tickets at LAS.com slash events. On Imperfect Paradise, Daniel Zamora's American dream ends at the U.S.-Mexico border. I just remember that my heart stopped. Subscribe to Imperfect Paradise from LA Studios, wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, this is Imperfect Paradise, a show about hidden worlds and messy realities. I'm Antonia Cerejido. Election years are notorious as a time when rhetoric on immigration and the U.S.-Mexico border escalate on both sides of the political spectrum. Even Democratic candidates over the past few decades have tended to take a more hardline stance on immigration leading up to elections. Just a few weeks ago, President Biden signed an executive order to cap asylum requests at the border during a surge. In actions to bar migrants who cross our southern border unlawfully. A move The New York Times called the single most restrictive border policy instituted by any modern Democrat even though he'd condemned a similar measure under the Trump presidency back in 2018. So in this election year, as the debates around immigration ramp up, as you're hearing sound bites and rallying cries, they're poisoning the blood of our country. We bring you a story about the toll America's immigration and border policies have on real people. Because the election is in less than six months, but the impact of these policies can last a lifetime. Back in 2021, reporter Lorena Rios traveled to Ciudad Juarez to meet up with a man named Daniel Zamora in a small cafe. And the place is tiny, uh, super cozy, a little bit dark. So Daniel and I sat by the window so that we could get a little bit of light. I wanted to meet Daniel because he's a retornado or returnee. A returnee can be someone who either by force or by choice goes back to their country of origin after being a migrant somewhere else. This is a global concept. But in this case, Lorena was interested in how return migration happens for Mexican migrants between the U.S. and Mexico. I was interested in the returnee community from a journalistic standpoint. But once I met Daniel and I started asking questions, I realized that the questions that I had for him were questions that I had about my own experience of return. In Daniel's story, Lorena heard echoes of her own. Lorena grew up in Monterrey, Mexico, until she was 17. For economic reasons, her family had to move to Texas in 2007. She would go to college in the States and then grad school, where she pursued journalism. But eventually, at the age of 28, for a complicated mix of reasons, she would find herself back in Mexico. For me, ever since I came back to Mexico five years ago, I felt disconnected from my home country, from my hometown, and unsure about where I want to be and my relationship to Mexico. So in that cafe in Juarez back in 2021, Lorena was wrapped by Daniel's story. In a lot of narratives about immigration, there is an underlying message that migrants come to the U.S. because life is better here, that it's more economically comfortable, more fulfilling, more free. But Daniel's story questions that assumption. Can you describe your relationship to Ciudad Juarez? Once I accepted my reality, I came to understand that beauty was all around me. Daniel's story spans from the cornfields of Iowa to the call centers of Juarez to the Eiffel Tower, Paris, France. It's about what it's like to leave everything you know and come back to a place that doesn't feel like home. And it all starts with a love story. This is episode one of Imperfect Paradise, Return to Mexico. Lorena Rios takes it from here. It was 2008, and Daniel Zamora had just graduated with an art degree from Grinnell College in Iowa. The look was buzz cut, 
graphic tees, and Chuck Taylors. His plan was to move home to L.A. and get a job. But his car had other ideas. My Jeep had some transmission problem. I was able to go forward, but not back. I knew that I would have to stay a couple of more days. So Daniel took his car to the shop. And while waiting for it to be fixed, he went out. A friend invited me over to go to a bar in Des Moines. We went to a gay bar called The Blazing Saddle. I was outside of the bar, smoking, and I met Eric Miller. It was nighttime. I think we're in the parking lot area. I mean, I guess it's romantic as that sounds. And I thought he was the most handsome guy, an outgoing type of a people person. Eric is this very handsome man from Michigan. He had this more like nerdy look the little button-down shirt, as white as he can get. Blue eyes, gorgeous smile, strawberry blonde. So I just had the courage and just went up and started talking to him. Daniel's version is slightly different. A friend of Eric came over to me and he told me, hey, my friend thinks you're cute. And I looked over to him and I'm like, well, tell him to tell me so, right? I've always thought that if you want to say something, say it to someone, right? Don't send someone else to do your dirty work. I mean, that very well could have happened. Like I said, it was a long time ago. (laughs) We went back inside, we danced a little bit. And we kissed. Perhaps it was the dancing and, you know, all this smoke. I don't know, but every single piece fell in the right place. And that was it. Daniel's car got fixed, but he'd be staying in Iowa with Eric. And less than two months after meeting that night, they moved in together. In the next two years, Daniel and Eric built their lives as a couple. They got a calico kitten and named her Bibi, decided to move to Austin, Texas, found jobs, made friends and settled into the daily rhythms of life. Daniel liked imagining his American life with Eric stretching into the future. He would come home and there would be apple pie baked, and I would be with him until we grew old. He made me feel safe, and I knew that as long as I was with him, I would be okay. I almost forgot where I had come from. I was living in a bubble. And the bubble felt really nice. One summer weekend in 2011, Daniel and Eric decided to go on a getaway to visit friends on South Padre Island, a resort town in Texas. It was a gravel road. It was kind of dusty. It was hot, very humid. I think there were just kind of like large open spaces, like, maybe ranches. Everything was kind of like light green. I was laying down. The music was playing. He was driving. I didn't have a care in the world. I was just waiting for us to get to the beach. I woke up because the road was feeling kind of bumpy. So I remember waking up, opening my eyes, and the first thing that I saw was that we were kind of in the middle of the bushes. We were on a dirt road. And I asked Derek, what are we doing? Where are we going? And he said, oh, I just want to see the wall. The wall, the artificial boundary that separates the U.S. from Mexico. For Eric, it was a curiosity. I was kind of interested, you know, the border and the river and just seeing what it was like. And I was like, oh, let's go down this road. I remember seeing the wall, big iron slats. And I think they were constructed in such a way that you couldn't squeeze through them. But you could see a little bit through them. But the wall meant something very different to Daniel. I felt like the time stood still for a second. 
I felt afraid. Daniel had crossed into the U.S. at 16 without papers. His parents had worked with a lawyer to get documentation for the family. Daniel says, as far as he knew, the process was still moving along. He and Eric didn't talk about it. So Eric had no idea that Daniel was undocumented. As they drove, they realized they weren't alone on the road. And suddenly, all of these Border Patrol trucks start showing up. One parks in front of us, and two more pull up behind us. I kept on telling myself that everything was going to be fine. Eric told me that everything was going to be fine. It was a routine check. The officers asked Daniel and Eric what they were doing there, asked them to show their IDs. Daniel says he wasn't given a reason for why they'd been pulled over. Normally, the Fourth Amendment protects you from arbitrary searches and seizures. But because of national security justifications, within 100 miles of the border, those rules don't apply. The officers focused their attention on Daniel. The police officers started struggling a little bit with my identity. They started going back and forth to figure out who I was. And they kept on pressuring me, telling me that I had just crossed the border. And I kept on telling them no. The officers told Daniel that they couldn't find him in the system and that he had to go with them to the station. Eric was confused. I thought maybe there was some sort of a... some sort of a mistake... I was told to face the car and to put my hands behind my back. I was handcuffed, and as I was being led to the Border Patrol truck, I just looked back and I saw Eric, and I wanted to say something and I couldn't. I just remember that my heart stopped. I'm Lorena Rios. In Perfect Paradise, we'll be right back. Selling a little or a lot? Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. <coughs> Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 15% better on average compared to other leading e-commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash paradise, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash paradise now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash paradise. What price would you pay to speak your mind? Lethal Descent is a nine-part podcast about Iran's hunt for dissidents abroad. Two Iranian officials resist the government and escape to Turkey. Now, one is alive and one is dead. To find out what happened, reporter Fariba Nawa immerses herself in a world of secret operatives and organized crime. A series from the world and the on-spec podcast, Lethal Descent. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lorena Rios. This is Imperfect Paradise, Return to Mexico. In that arid stretch of South Texas, 
Daniel says he was handcuffed by Border Patrol and driven to an immigration processing office in McAllen. Daniel says he was asked to sit at a big semicircular desk. The desk was a fake yellow wood color, and behind it, Daniel could see holding cells with people in them. Across the desk, various officers were typing away, trying to find records of him in the database. They kept on going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until an officer told him, like, you know what, I can't find anything. This other officer came back and he said, like, let me have a go. Daniel remembers waiting for an hour, sitting on a cold concrete bench until eventually, he says one of the officers looked up and told Daniel that he'd found a removal order against him, meaning he could be deported. Daniel was confused. He knew he was undocumented, but he thought he was on track to being documented in some way. But at the Border Processing Center, Daniel found out this was not true. According to a document we got from the Board of Immigration Appeals, his parents had lost their case back around 2004. The family had been put under a deportation order, but they did not leave the U.S. Daniel says he didn't know about it, and his parents didn't talk to us for this story. But this deportation order, that's what must have shown up in the database. At the station, Daniel was anxious. And as the gravity of the situation started to sink in, he was presented with two impossible options. When they told me that I would have to be removed from the country, and I told them, like, well, you know, can I call a lawyer? And they said very clearly, no. Like, you have two choices. You can either stay in jail until an immigration judge can see you, but that can take months, and I'll make sure that it takes a long time. Or I could leave, and I could apply for reentry. We tracked down a lawyer who would end up helping Daniel pro bono, and she explained it this way. Basically, Daniel was in a lose-lose situation. He could either be put in detention and wait for a court date, or be deported. I foolishly thought that I would be able to come back as soon as I set foot in Mexico. I was going to be able to reapply for reentry in the U.S. or within a couple of years, you know, and I would be reunited with my family once again. At the office in South Texas, Daniel was alone, no lawyers, no parents, and no information about his rights or how the immigration legal system even worked, which researchers and lawyers say is not uncommon in these types of situations. Daniel was conflicted, and he was being pressured to make a decision quickly. I have this picture in my head of trying to put a house together made out of rocks, but there's no mortar or there's no glue holding the rocks together. And then suddenly you are putting the last rock up and everything looks fine and it looks beautiful, but suddenly it just falls. And there's nothing you can do to stop it because there's no glue and nothing is holding it together. The first rock that made up Daniel's American life was Los Angeles. I honestly think that my life started when I moved to LA. Daniel's parents had immigrated to the U.S. from Mexico to find work. They didn't have papers, and when he had just turned 16, Daniel says he joined them, crossing by himself with a coyote. As soon as he got to Los Angeles, he threw himself into his new life and the American teenager experience. 
I took the metro for the first time. My mom took me down to Los Callejones in LA, right? The alleys in Fashion District. And we would go to a 99 cent store. And I had my first McDonald's breakfast. LA felt like the most wonderful place on earth. That's what I think Disneyland feels like to people who visit it. <laughs> it felt welcoming. You said you knew like two, three phrases in English. Do you remember what those were? <laughs> I actually do. Hello, my name is Daniel. I live in Mexico. And I used to say like, how much is it? That's as much as I knew. Daniel says he worked really hard to learn English so he could go back to school. I would come back home and I would literally sit down with the newspaper, the LA Times, and my dictionary and a notebook. So I would literally have to translate every single word in that newspaper. And I would do that for one or two hours every day. As you will learn from other migrants, we learn English and we learn how to speak it very quickly. Not because we want to, but because we need to. Daniel enrolled in high school as a freshman. He sent us some photos of himself from this time. Oversized tees and jeans, white sketchers, braces, and a library copy of Harry Potter. Daniel says he got good grades and he also started making friends. And he would end up finding most of his friends in his favorite part of high school, theater. He started learning all about vocal exercises and doing plays after school. Daniel says that he wasn't really outgoing before, but being a part of the theater, being on the stage, it made him more comfortable to be true to himself and his sexuality. There's one moment in particular that felt pivotal. When he got cast in the musical, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. There's a scene where his character wears a dress and Daniel remembers looking for his mom in the audience. I was wearing a dress and a wig and I walk out on stage and I look at my mom's face and I was expecting to see shock. I was expecting to see disappointment or something. And all I saw was a smile on her face. And she started laughing hysterically when she saw me like that. And everybody started laughing hysterically. It felt wonderful. And when I started wearing a rainbow belt, a rainbow bracelet, it was fine. No one criticized me or ostracized me for being gay. I would have never thought living in Mexico, that I could be that free. As high school came to an end, he had to think about what came after, about college. And for the first time, he says his immigration status came up as a real obstacle. I knew the situation that I was in. And I knew what I couldn't have. And what I couldn't have was the American dream. But why, why, why couldn't you have that? Because I needed to have more privileges that I wasn't able to access. My dream at that point was just to have an education. But I couldn't because I was strapped by my resources. Because he was undocumented, he couldn't get federal financial aid. He said his parents were not making enough money to pay for college. His dad worked at a warehouse and his mom worked as a cleaner. But then, Daniel's teachers nominated him for a competitive scholarship, which pays for low-income kids to go to top private colleges across the country. And Daniel, with his good grades, charm, and determination, got the scholarship. I felt like I could taste a little bit of like that American dream, that American life that some other classmates were seeing. And that's how Daniel ended up in Iowa. When I got to the college, 
I felt like I was illegally blonde when she walks into Harvard and she sees these great holes. Danielle went to Grinnell College, a school of about 1,500 students at the time. About a thousand of them were white and only 55 were Hispanic. Daniel says he used his theater skills to make friends with everyone, and he felt like the world opened up. It was my first time actually interacting all the time with people who had a life that was, to a certain extent, full of privileges. Friends whose vacations were in Aspen or who were going to Paris Fashion Week. He decided to make the most of it. He studied art and took all sorts of classes, like sculpture, dance, painting, printmaking, and photography. I wanted to explore beauty, to actually explore every single aspect of my life, of my body, of my perspective of the world, and put it on paper. It all culminated in a solo art exhibit at his graduation. Daniel's parents flew out and got to see the piece he made called 12 Moons, a wedding dress that was torn apart and coiled up to look like the moon. It was dedicated to his mom, who had never had a wedding, and it was accompanied by a poem. And it's talking about how my mom, I see her as a moon that even though she's not with me or she's not close to me, I always keep her in mind, in my heart, And whenever I need to, I can reach out and I can see her there. So it was very beautiful to have my parents there. And I I am forever grateful (laughs) they were able to see me walk on stage and get that diploma. Daniel finished school in 2008, the year Obama became president. Daniel told us he canvassed for Barack Obama who was campaigning on what is still known as La Promesa de Obama, a promise to Latino voters that he'd deliver comprehensive immigration reform, including a legal path for millions of undocumented immigrants in the U.S. While we work to strengthen our borders, we need a practical solution for the problem of 12 million people who are here without documentation, many of whom have lived and worked here for years. That's why we need to offer those who are willing to make amends a pathway to citizenship. In a lot of ways, Daniel was graduating into a landscape of optimism for immigrants in America. I fought for you in the Senate, and I will make it a top priority in my first year as president of the United States of America. But all of that would soon sour. Maybe my biggest disappointment was uh, this DREAM Act vote. By the time that Daniel was driving along the Texas border with Eric in 2011, there had been no comprehensive immigration reform. The DREAM Act, which aimed to grant legal status to young people brought by their parents without papers to the U.S., failed to pass Congress. It was a bill meant to protect people like Daniel, who had spent their formative years in the U.S. and who felt America was their home. In 2012, President Obama established Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, through executive action. But it would be too late for Daniel. La Promesa did not come to pass. But enforcement did ramp up as Obama faced criticism from border hawks. Expansions of ICE, Border Patrol and CBP, and record numbers of deportations every year of Obama's first term. We have more of everything. ICE, Border Patrol, surveillance, you name it. For us, this president has been the deporter-in-chief. The majority of the deportations, 72%, were migrants from Mexico. Removals, immigrants formally expelled and barred from returning, have risen to an all-time high. Under the Obama administration, nearly 3 million people were deported from the U.S. And Daniel was about to become one of them. That's 
after the break on Imperfect Paradise. I'm Lorena Rios. Hey everyone, I'm Dan Cortler, the host of TED Climate. Each episode, we unpack the problems and solutions of climate change. This season of the show, we're getting into some big ideas that make us optimistic about the future, like meat grown from cells and leather made from mushrooms. And the best part? We look at how building a greener future can be an upgrade instead of a sacrifice. Find and follow TED Climate wherever you're listening to this. One event can change a family for generations. I'm Emily Kwong, host of a new podcast from LAS Studios called Inheriting. It's about Asian American and Pacific Islander families and their histories. Join me for an immersive storytelling event at the Crawford in Pasadena. It's June 27th. Get your tickets now at las.com slash events. This is Imperfect Paradise, Return to Mexico. I'm Lorena Rios. At the Border Patrol station, Daniel spent five hours trying to figure out what to do, whether he wanted to risk spending months in a detention center. I just felt like I wasn't going to be able to make it in jail, regardless of whatever happened. I mean, jail was going to be worse than coming back to Mexico. So I asked them if I could call Eric. They said yes. I called him and I let him know that I had decided that the best thing to do was to be deported. Daniel decided to go through with the deportation process. But he couldn't totally escape detention. He says officers processed him into a cell. I was told to undress, I got the uniform, and then I was told to wait. When I was going to the prison facility where I was held, I noticed that all the men that I was in the cell with were either barefoot or they had shoes without laces on them. I was feeling shame because I felt like I had let my parents down that all the time spent at school, all the money that they had put into my education was all being wasted. I just sat down on a corner and I was really, really cold and I was hungry and I didn't know what time it was. He thinks he was in there for about five days, but he has trouble remembering. It was all a blur. And I felt like I was spiraling down, and it got progressively worse. I started feeling like my life had no meaning. I felt like I had lost everything. When you're in this moment of despair, you think about the craziest things that you know that you could easily, you know, make it all end with the sheets that you have there, with the metal sink. Finally, an officer handed him his clothes and told him it was time to go. We were driven at night to an airport. And I saw this huge airplane. And I saw how they started loading up. The buses of people, they started loading up the plane. I had those um, chains that have handcuffs on your wrist and on your ankles. And it was really hard to walk up those metal stairs and to get on the plane. And they're cold and the night felt cold and I was angry. Daniel says he was flown from Texas to Yuma, Arizona, then rode a bus along the U.S.-Mexico border. He remembers looking out the window at the rusted metal wall and thinking how it could have been an installation by the artist Richard Serra. In a strange twist of fate, 
Daniel was briefly back in California, where his parents lived. The bus took him across the Calexico Bridge to Mexicali in Mexico. He remembers seeing the Mexican flag waving in the air. I wanted to turn around because I felt like I didn't belong in Mexico. I was being brought back to a place that saw me be born, but no longer felt like home. And if home is where your heart is, my heart was in Texas, and I was heartless. There's this particular moment Daniel remembers from the bus ride when the guards turned on the radio. The one song that stuck with me as I saw the Mexican border coming up was Cielo Green's Fuck You. I don't know the song. How does the song go? (laughs) So the song says, you've been riding around with the girl I love, that you've been doing your best, but now she's with someone else. that phrase, forget you, I felt it down in my heart as a goodbye song from me to America. Lorina Rios is the lead reporter of Imperfect Paradise, Return to Mexico. Coming up, what it takes to get to the U.S. physically and emotionally. And I was starting to feel the heat stroke coming. And we started running. And I have no idea where we were. What it means to be ripped from your home and the people you love. When I finally saw him pull up on the street where I was living, I didn't know whether to kiss him or not. This story is about transition. And I started having this weird struggle within the Mexican part that has this beautiful freedom that can go anywhere, or the American one that wants to come back and is always like longing for something that he no longer has. How Daniel found a sense of home in the middle of all that uncertainty and reclaimed his homeland. This episode of Imperfect Paradise, Return to Mexico, was written and reported by Lorena Rios. Co-writing by Natalie Chudnovsky, who is also the senior producer of the show. I'm the show's host, Antonia Cerejido. Catherine Milhouse is the executive producer of the show, and Shayna Naomi Crockmull is our vice president of podcasts. Our producer and sound designer is Emma Alabaster. Our editor is Sofia Parisa Carr. Our editorial consultant is Leslie Berestein Rojas. Jens Campbell is our production coordinator. Fact-checking by Caitlin Antonios. Mixing by E. Scott Kelly. And additional engineering by Donald Paz. Special thanks to the professors, researchers, and lawyers we talked to for our reporting, including David Shirk, Niels Frenzen, Jody Seismer, and Tobin Hansen. If you or anyone you know has been having suicidal thoughts, you can call the 24-hour Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988 This podcast is powered by listeners like you. Support the show by donating now at las.com slash join. This podcast is supported by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. On Imperfect Paradise, Daniel Zamora was living the American dream. He graduated from a prestigious university, fell in love, built a home. But then a road trip near the U.S.-Mexico border shattered his life. I have this picture in my head trying to put a house together made out of rocks, but there's no glue holding the rocks together. And then suddenly, it just falls. Subscribe to Imperfect Paradise from Alea Studios, wherever you get your podcasts.